Good afternoon. Uh, welcome to the 2023 Grad Futures Forum, a graduate professional development conference organized by the Graduate School at Princeton University. My name is Sonali Majumdar. I am the Assistant Dean for Professional Development in the Grad Futures team. Um, and it's my utmost pleasure to invite and welcome you here in this space for an afternoon full of talks on research communication, including science policy. So since the launch of Grad Futures in fall of 2019, the Graduate School has continued its commitment to expand professional development for graduate students, um, and now serves as Princeton's hub for empowering graduate student futures through a broad spectrum of skills training, mentorship, interdisciplinary connections, as well as experiential opportunities. We created this annual conference, um, which is open access, to both advance the future of our and professional development of our own graduate students and postdocs in the Princeton community, as well as those beyond Princeton. Because we do see the benefit of scaling and sustaining as well as access to professional development for all in graduate education. With that, I would like to you welcome you today to the first talk that we have on research communication uh, called Giving a Great Talk, How to Engage Listeners When You're the Only Expert in the Room. This talk is co-sponsored by the Council on Science and Technology, so thank you to our partners um, who are in the room. We really appreciate your collaboration. Um, before I invite and uh, introduce the moderator for today, one housekeeping item. Um, when you walk out of this room, you'll get uh, all of you would get a free copy of Championing Science, uh, which our authors are sitting right here, um, and they can sign it for you in real time. However, the perk for those who are asking questions at the end of today's talk is you will receive a signed copy by the authors. They've already signed a few copies for you. So, you know, going from yesterday's talk, do bring in that bravery and initiative and come up here or we'll run to you to get your questions at the end. With that, I want to introduce today's moderator, Rose Gingrich, graduate student in psychology department, and for most importantly for us, a professional development associate in the Grad Futures program, as well as, I'm gonna marry you in a second right now, uh, one of our uh, several grad students who won this year's NSF Graduate Research Fellowship program yesterday. So big hand to Rose. <laughs> and if that is nothing, that is a testament to the power of good communication on your research. And with that, I would let Rose take it over and walk us through today's session. Yeah, you can save that applause for after this amazing talk. Um, I'm very honored to introduce Amy Ains, our speaker today. Um, she has done so much, um, so listen close as I list off all of her amazing accomplishments um, and why she is the best person to be speaking about this here today. So, Amy Ains is known for saying, words matter. She has fueled the success of hundreds of leaders and more than 50 companies in the telecom, tech, and biotech industries by choosing words that get results. Amy is a communication strategist, speaker coach, trainer, and former telecommunications industry executive who helps spread mobile tech phone technology around the world. She is author of the How To Book, Championing Science, Communicating Your Ideas to Decision Makers. She and her husband, Roger, he's a scientist who will be joining us for our fireside chat later, wrote Championing Science to teach essential communication, relationship building, and influence skills. Amy honed her experience during corporate and public policy communications and serving as a spokesperson for a $10 billion company. She has managed every imaginable communications function. In 1999, Amy left corporate America for consulting. Her client roster includes startups and global giants, BioMartin, Cisco, and Verizon Wireless, to name just a few. These days, you'll find her speaking or leading experiential learning workshops that she designs to bring her book to life for graduate students and early career professionals. Since 2019, she's taught cohorts at NASA, the National Postdoc Association, Stanford, and many more. She also gives her time as an advisor to the STEM Advocacy Institute, Quest Science Center, and beyond the PhD. 
We are very fortunate to have Amy with us at the Grad Futures Forum to share her passion and advice for helping us communicate with greater confidence, clarity, and impact. So join me in welcoming our speaker, an expert on speaking, Amy Ames. Thank you. This is a picture of innovation. When you trace those colored lines, what you see are advances in touchscreens and Wi-Fi and batteries and computing. You see people and you see decades of development that brought us one of the most life-changing tools for humanity, our smartphone. When I think about these accomplishments, because I'm a communication strategist, what, what comes to mind for me are all the conversations the proposals, the presentations, the debates that went on with people who were experts like you, who had ideas, who did the research, and who ultimately were able to convince their colleagues and decision makers to support their work. So that's why I'm so passionate about your communication skills. They will set you apart. Your ability to engage people, especially when you're a technical expert, will give you career rocket fuel. I know it, I'm sure of it, I've seen it, thank you, throughout my entire career. And that's what makes me so glad I get a chance to talk to you today and that people are joining us on Zoom and that this is recorded because my passion is to help you take your knowledge and expertise and do more with it in the world. And if you get good at the kinds of things I'm going to be talking about today, I just know you'll go further. I've seen it. So what are we doing together? Well, I'm going to unpack three concepts to give you some tools that you can put to use anytime you speak. And I have two goals for this session. The first is to change your mind to convince you that it's worth it to invest the time to do this anytime you give a talk. And my other goal is to get you up the learning curve as fast as I can do it, because you can start now to make an impact. You can start now. So my message for you today is that you will have more impact in the world when you are Click, strategic, <laughs> structured, and selfless when you speak. Strategic, structured, and selfless. So those are the three things that we're going to talk about today. Being strategic. That's all the things you do before you open PowerPoint. It's the thinking process. It's the curation. It's the decisions you make about being the expert, what, what am I going to put into this talk? And you need to have a very specific goal and an overarching message, a big message that you want people to take away at the end of listening to you. So your goal might be simply to inform. You're giving a research talk like Rose is about to do next week. Or you might want to enlist people. You want them to become collaborators or introduce you to people who might be able to fund your work. Or you might have a bigger goal. You may want to drive action. Some of you may want to get a VC or an angel investor to fund your Series A. For some of you, that might be getting the hiring manager to pick you for the job. Or someday it may be policy, like my husband Roger, who you see here. Roger is the chief scientist of the energy program at Lawrence Livermore Lab. You see him here testifying at a joint hearing. Go to my next one. I'm going to hold there for a bit. And for Roger, the goal was very clear. He wanted to pave the way for legislation that would include taking carbon dioxide out of the air. That's what he works on. The message part of it took careful thought. And the reason for that is that there was a Republican-controlled House, and what he said had to resonate on both sides of the aisle. So for us, that's dinner table conversation. That's what you do when you, know, you're, you do communications, and he's a scientist. And um, his message was not focused on the climate crisis. It wasn't focused in depth on technology. 
His message was about the new carbon economy, the opportunity to usher in economic growth by taking carbon dioxide out of the air and putting it into products and repurposing it in new ways. So how do you figure that out? You're an expert, you're about to give a talk somewhere. How do you decide what, what is my specific goal? What's my big message? You do it by answering a strategic question. What do you want listeners to feel, think, and do? Feel, think, and do. I imagine some of you are kind of wondering why there's a heart up there and the word feel shows up at the beginning, especially if you're coming out of the STEM disciplines. And I can tell you why that's first. Human beings are feeling beings who think, not thinking beings who feel. We feel first. And if you remember anything today, please remember that, because connecting with people is a human thing. And you can't forget about the importance of feelings. I was even more convinced of how vital this is listening to David Linden, who's a neuro, um, neuroscientist at Johns Hopkins, and what he had to say will help you appreciate why we can't forget about feelings, even if we're talking about technical topics and research. Emotion and perception aren't separate things. They're deeply intertwined at the very first moments of perception. It's not as just, oh, we can take in objective information and then only later do we begin to put an emotional gloss on it. No, that's not the way it works. From the very first moment you perceive things through any of your senses, whether it is a, it's touch or, or, or sight or smell or hearing, there is an emotional, like a contextual aspect to that. So... As you're thinking about curating your talk, think about what do you want people to feel as a result of listening to you? And how can you build your talk in a way where that's what happens, where you give them something that helps them feel? Another strategic principle, and it's foundational in, in championing science, is the idea that if you want your ideas to be heard and understood, they have to be, or you can't drive action. You can't talk over people's heads and expect them to do something. So what that really means is that information needs to be accessible. As you're curating your talk, you have to ask yourself, how do I make this information accessible to the people who are gonna be in the room listening to me? And that starts by knowing who's listening. And I think about it as listeners, because you want people to listen. You want to engage them in a way that they will listen. You don't want to talk in a monotone, because that makes it hard for people to listen. You want to really think about and find out as much as you can so that you know what people's level of knowledge is about your topic, what kind of mindset they might have already, and last but not least, what they care about, what they're most interested in. And the way to do that is to ask. Google makes it easy. You can find out a lot about people, what's in their Twitter feed, what they post on LinkedIn. Sometimes you can even see them in action on YouTube. And if you know their names, if you're meeting with a small group of people, you can do a fair amount of homework. But what if you're me? Here, today, we, we haven't met. You ask. You ask all the organizers. You talk to everybody you can who can give you a better sense of who's in the room and, and what they care about. And as you're curating, you keep that in mind. So one of the things that I learned, and it didn't surprise me at all, is that innovation and academic entrepreneurship are really thriving here. So I have a story for you about Xing Xiang, a biomedical engineering graduate from Melbourne Uni, as they call it. Very impressive guy who really learned the value of being strategic. I met Xing as a result of going to a conference with Roger in Australia just about a month before Championing Science was published. So it was December of 2018. And I was so excited when he said, yes, sure, you can interview me for a blog post. He was somebody who 
had done some pretty impressive things really early in his career. And his story around how he became a better communicator was what I was fascinated by. But he started by telling me about the one course that changed everything for him. It was a bio design course, bioengineering design course, where he met this group of colleagues. They became fast friends. They had a lot of respect for each other. I imagine that might be happening for some of you in your classes. And they figured out that they all had a shared passion. They wanted to be change makers. They wanted to do something that really, really mattered. So they focused on the needs of premature babies because their research showed that there weren't tools expressly designed for their needs. So they came up with the idea of creating a device that enables a more accurate placement of the umbilical catheter that really is the lifeline when babies are born so tiny and so vulnerable for getting medicines and nutrients to them. And they formed Navi Medical Technologists, Technologies. They've raised $7 million so far. And Xing became their chief operating officer. And all of a sudden, it was very clear to him that he needed to be a better communicator. So he started trying to figure it out and reading a lot of books. And he picked up some important things. And he was named to the 30 under 30 list from Forbes in Asia. And he started getting noticed. So one of the people who noticed was in government. He had an opportunity to meet with Linda Dassault. And Xing did his research. I know you're all good at research. When you're meeting with important people, you need to find out who they are. You need to dig a little so you know who they are. What he learned was that she was a judge. She had presided over family court. She dealt with a lot of medical malpractice cases. And she was a decision maker on a human research ethics committee. So this was one of those meetings that you really wanted to get right. So he thought about it. What was he going to do? He only had five minutes with her. He needed to make that time really count. So I sat there like, OK, how did it go? What happened? And I want you to read what he told me. He'd done his homework. He'd figured it out. He found a way to have a fabulous elevator pitch. And for Xing, doing your research paid off royally, literally royally. He had a chance to meet Prince Harry and Meghan Markle. They got to hear about the med tech innovation that his team was working on. Because in his five minutes with Linda, he whet her appetite for knowing more. That's a powerful elevator pitch. So I chose to tell you that story because effective strategies have relevant stories. I could have simply said, do your research, find out who's in the room, know as much as you can about them, try to find a point of connection. But stories are more engaging and memorable, especially when they're purposeful. So you are far more likely to remember to do your research and that it can pay off royally because I told you about Xing. And that's because our brains are literally wired for story. Since the earliest days of humanity, we've been telling stories. And it's because stories engage more of the brain than facts and data. If you look at the blue circles, you see what's triggered with facts and data. It's our language processing and our, lang and our language comprehension. But look how much more of the brain we get engaged. So as you're an expert in the room, you want to think about how to tell an engaging story. And one of the things that engages people is emotion. If, if you have triggered something emotional, the amygdala gets involved. And when the amygdala gets involved, that's like having a highlighter pen underlying what you've just said. So know that. Know that as you're curating your, your materials for your talk, you want to find a way to create connection, because that's what's going to enable you to be a more engaging speaker. And crafting stories to make them memorable means they need to include a few things. They need to have enough specifics to hang together in a way where they make sense and they build toward the purpose you're telling the story. The more vivid, the more colorful you make them, the better off you are. 
And if you can put me in it so that I'm living it with you, it's the difference between a reporting what's happened and inviting me in. And if I'm narrating, like I just did talking about Xing, how I met him, how I talked to him, what that was like for me. I'm narrating that. That helps bring you in. That helps make it more engaging. You can talk about research in the lab. You can talk about the night you were there with your family waiting for you to come home for Thanksgiving, and it was 2 AM, and everything was dark. You were the only one there. There were some strange noises in the lab. I mean, you can bring me in with you so I get to be part of your story. That's what makes them compelling. Very simply to bring people in, you want to talk about place and time and people, those three things. And Sammy Khan is sitting over there. <laughs> she could tell you more, and I'm going to mention some more about this later. But there are great programs here, thanks to the Council on Science and Technology, for you to learn storytelling. And I want you to know, you need to do this when you interview for jobs. If you want to stand out as a candidate and be more memorable, you need to talk about who you are and what you've done using story techniques. So it is absolutely one of the things that you should find time to do. And there's a boot camp that uh, will help you really learn those skills. So to wrap up what it means to be strategic, you're curating. You're picking the pieces of your talk. What's going to go into this? And I think about it a little bit like fabric squares. And some of you who are familiar with quilts might recognize those little pieces ultimately take shape to reveal something. And that's how you want to think about it. That's what being strategic means. That's putting together the pieces that answer the question, what do you want your listeners to feel, think, and do when they're listening to you? So. We've talked about being strategic. Now we're going to dig into structure. First, why does structure matter? It matters because people will be better able and more accurately able to remember what you said. And what happens with a lot of people who are in research who have so many things in their heads is they give talks that are and, 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 and. And you might be a good speaker, but I don't have anything to anchor that to. So structure matters. I'm going to take you through, step by step, through this structure, because it lends itself to talking about your research, starting with the problem. The problem. The beauty of starting with the problem is it lets you get people connected to your reason for doing your work. There was some kind of problem that got you interested in studying what you're studying, right? And it begins to let you talk about why. I want to give you an example from a company called Change Water. They talk about the fact that 2.6 billion people on our planet don't have a toilet they can flush, and that 40% of the world doesn't have access to, to safe sanitation, and the risk that it causes for kids like this, who have to leave in the dark and wander oftentimes alone because they don't have toilets. That's the why. When you talk about the problem, talk about why. Then you want to get into what we don't know yet, what we haven't figured out, what would help us get to the answer if we were able to take this next step, go a little bit further. And then you get to make an emotion, another emotional appeal. You get to talk about the possibility. Yes, it's only, found, it's only foundational research, basic research. But basic research has opened incredible doors. And when you believe your basic research is important, there are possibilities you imagine someday, even if we don't know what they are now. Then you talk about your research. Now notice, that comes forth. Everything you've done here is to set it up. And as an expert, you will be far more engaging if you don't just don't dive right in into your research. Because I need a place to put that, especially if I'm not at all familiar with the kind of work that you do. I need a place to put it in my head. So this setup is really important. The last piece is the ask. It's almost always missing. Almost always missing. But you have an opportunity every time you speak. And it is another way to engage people, 
to get them to do something, or maybe to just give you their point of view on what they think of your research idea. So having an ask is an important part of creating connection. And I have an ask for you. It's coming, I promise. There will be one. Hey! Hey! I got your attention, right? You didn't expect that. I could tell by the look on your face. It's kind of fun to jump up in front of the room. I don't recommend that technique, actually. But I'm doing it because the very first thing you have to do is grab attention. When you step up, the first words out of your mouth have to be something that engages me, that gets me to want to hear what you have to say. So I'm going to step through three examples. A compelling full screen photo that has people curious and wondering, what are you looking at? Well, it happens to be the eye of a giant Australian cuttlefish, just so you know. Another way to engage people is by coming up with an intriguing question. And Roger and I really like the what if you could question because it taps into possibility, right? What if we could figure this out? What would it be like, right? So what if we could filter and purify water affordably anywhere using the power of the sun? What if we could control mosquitoes that carry deadly diseases with a chemical that smells like you or me? What if we could make a salt grain sized camera that had the clarity of the one on our smartphones? Well, the good news is we can, you can. This is innovation that's happened at Princeton. And if you haven't spent time on the innovation website, go there. It is inspiring. It's really inspiring. But a what if you could question works just as well if you're just starting on your research. What if we could predict the impact that AI, that AI will have in the future. So you don't have to have the answers to use the what if you could question. I'm going to keep going, and we'll catch up when whatever happens, happens. Um, the third example is to, is to make a provocative statement, something like, a hypothesis is a liability. And I happen to know that you got to attend the night science workshop. So you heard conversation about that. A hypothesis is a liability comes from the work by two professors who were here during winter session. And who were here during winter session. And that kind of a statement draws people in. It gets them wondering what it is you're going to be talking about. And the folks at Grad Futures are going to share that work. So take a look on that website. Find out about this workshop. It was really thought provoking because it's about the creative side of doing science. So I highly recommend you, you check it out. All right, we're good. So you've grabbed attention. Now what? Big picture. You've got to start by building the big picture. You can't jump into a lot of details because that's not engaging. That is making me go into the deep end before I'm ready. So Dr. John Medina talks about this in his book, and he says essentially the same thing. If you want people to be able to pay attention, you can't give details. You've got to really give a key idea first. So I want to come back to the change water example and the importance of focusing on why. Once you've done your intro, once you've painted the big picture, then you really want to engage people around the why it matters part of the story. And Diana Youssef is the CEO at Change Water. And as you can see, her why has an emotional component to it. Our toilet can affect incomes, change livelihoods, help women, ease climate change. It can change everything. Those words are going to draw you in. So try to figure out what the connection is for you, for your work. It's only after that kind of setup that the folks at Change Water start to talk about the what. And they do it by focusing on the benefits. No water, no plumbing. Oop, go back, sorry. No water, no plumbing. And as you can see, there's a sketch that shows the evaporative pouch 
that begins to help you understand how they've designed this toilet. And it's only after they've used terms like evaporative pouch that they get into talking about the membrane. They have this very special membrane, but they don't jump all the way to membrane until they've gone in this order because structural hierarchy is really important to engage the people in the room. Start with your hey, focus on the why before the what, then pick the most relevant benefits. And there's a general rule that people do a better job of remembering three things, just three. And sometimes we get carried away and want to talk about all the great things related to what we're doing. But pick the three that matter most to the people listening. So you really have to know your listeners. For Change Water, if they're talking to, to human rights advocates, they're not really focused on the power side of it. They're focused on the safety side of it. And last but not least, you pick the details that are most meaningful. And just like I had to decide, there's so much I could be talking about right now in terms of being engaging, but I didn't have enough time to do it all. So I had to choose, I had to curate for you. All right, last but not least at all is being selfless. Being selfless, what do I mean by that? At the core, being selfless as a speaker is caring most about your listeners and the value you bring to them. It's about showing them respect and it's about being helpful. Respect and being helpful. And that means you have to put in the time. You really need to think about why have they asked me here? Sometimes that's what happens. You're brought in because you're an expert. And if you tell me everything you know, you're going to overwhelm me. If you sort through what you know, you can be much more helpful in enabling me to make a better decision or understand a problem better or understand how we might work together to solve a problem. Being selfless is taking your expertise out into the world and talking about the work you do because STEM literacy makes for better communities, healthier people. And I imagine many of you have something to add to that conversation. So the other reason to get good at this is that you can contribute to STEM literacy. And believe me, that is part of making an impact. It's a really important part of making an impact. What it really means is you need to be understood which is so different from sitting in most lectures because your professor is going to give you the fire hose, right? You're going to just have to drink from it. You got you to totally shift gears. You have to find a way to be completely understood by the people listening to you. Again, you need to know who they are so you can try to figure out, how do I speak in a way that I'll be understood? And the reason that's so important is that cognitive overload happens fast. People literally tune you out. If you go on, some of the research I've seen says, if you go on for more than two and a half minutes and you're saying things and using words that I don't understand, I am not gonna stay engaged. And you're gonna have to work really hard as a speaker to bring me back to paying attention. So now I wanna talk about several different things you can do to be helpful, to be more engaging. Starting with this idea, it's a concept from our book, Extract the Essence. What does that mean? It means find the fewest number of words to make your point. And you don't just walk into the diamond mind and grab out a diamond, you gotta dig for it. So extracting the essence is a digging process. It's a distillation process. And it's something that takes some time and thought because you have so much in your head about what's important with your work. So, Learning how to extract the essence in conversations, it's important too. Very important skill. Now I want to talk a little bit more about slides, okay? What you've probably noticed here is I cover one idea per slide. That will make you as an expert more engaging. That paces you. That paces what you're saying for the people listening to you. One idea per slide. And unfortunately, you're used to looking at stuff like this, and I can see it. I can see the way the head's moved. You are not listening to me. You are trying to decipher this. Where did it come from? What does it mean? What are those formulas? What's going on here? 
I know that's part of your graduate school education and, and I'm all for it, but when you're an expert and you go out into the world and you're the only one in the room, you can't use your same slides. You just can't. You've got to spend time to fix them. And fixing them is about making it easy for people to stay focused. Okay, so this comes from work being done at Northeastern's Networks, um, Network Science Institute. And it's research that was done during COVID looking at social isolation. And you can see here that you don't have to know much about this to understand that it was the unemployed respondents that were the ones who felt more socially isolated. And you know that because the headline color and the, and the dots in magenta tell you that. The slide is designed to explain the point so that you can look at it and see it. And this comes from work by Edward Tufte. He was one of the early pioneers in data visualization. He was over at Yale. Um, does anybody here know Tufte? Have you read anything about him or seen his work? One hand. Highly recommend go to the library. Check out Tufty's stuff. He has so much information about how to use color, how to draw attention to things. And the concept you're looking at here is one that he calls minimal non-data ink. And what that means is don't put it on the slide unless it really tells people what they need to know. And we don't need a lot of access to figure things out. We don't. We need to take the time to simplify what gets exported from the programs that you use for consumption by non-experts. Figure out good analogies about your work because they are a gift to the people who are listening to you. They're super respectful and helpful because they create a bridge from something people are familiar with to some new concept that they don't understand yet. So I'm talking about tau. It's a protein implicated in a lot of neurodegenerative diseases, including Alzheimer's. And I could tell you that when tau misfolds, it sticks together like poorly handled tape. You don't have to know anything about the molecular structure. You don't have to have studied biology. You immediately get this is a messy problem that's hard to solve. That's what you need to know. That's the message. That's the beauty of analogies. But many technical folks are hesitant to use them because they're not precise. And I want to be really clear. I am all for precision when it matters. But to be engaging as an expert, you have to balance precision with impact. This is about communicating something that's going to change behavior potentially, or get you funding, or get a colleague to become a collaborator. In that case, you might want to give a little bit more technical detail. But for the most part, you want to use analogies to help people build a bridge to understanding. I want to give you a fabulous example. Whoops. Oh, I see what happened. OK, go back. I want to give you a fabulous example, because as an expert, sometimes you do have to explain a technical term. It's part of how people will understand your research. And this comes from a student who did a brilliant job from University of Virginia. I'm talking about the axon initial segment in her work on Alzheimer's. And Mercy Best used her arm to literally show, along with a very simplified drawing. And as you see, the area that's highlighted in red, that's the axon initial segment. She's even got a bracelet on her wrist to draw attention to it. And she spoke about it as being like a broken wrist, allowing tau to get into a part of the brain cell that it didn't belong. Really clear, creative analogy to explain a technical term. So I'm not saying you can't use those terms. Don't expect people to learn six of them in one talk. That would be overload. But do it in a way where they can anchor to something they understand. And that is so much more engaging than standing up and, and giving a lecture style talk. You heard that I'm big on words mattering. They are. When you're an expert, you want to think about what's going to be music to the ears of people listening to me. And what makes music is words that are common that I don't have to think hard to translate. Because guess what? If that happens, I'm less focused on you. I'm busy going, oh, I'm not really sure what are all the greenhouse gases. 
Make them concrete. Talk about wind and solar so I don't have to translate renewable energy. Even though people might know that, it's still a click where they have to let their brain split its time from focusing on you to thinking, what exactly are the renewables? Last but not least, make what you say conversational. And that's also a shift because you're at Princeton. And this is a place that's academic, where you sound scholarly when you talk about your work. So you really have to be selfless. You have to make that shift and care more about serving the needs of your listeners than making it easy for you to stand up and give a talk in three days. You got to put in the time. And I want to play an example for you from one of Princeton's own, who does an amazing job an expert, absolutely. Jesse Jenkins has been sought after with all the conversation about getting to net zero. And I want you to hear in a minute the clip that is the intro to a podcast he did with Ezra Klein from the New York Times. And then I want to unpack what he says to help you see why being conversational is the way to bring people in. You can bet that podcast was long and it was full of lots more detail. But when you start, you have to engage people and help them like you're walking right beside them. You don't want to get ahead of them. You want to walk beside them. Go ahead and play it for me. Thanks. Thanks for having me. I appreciate that. I'm a, I'm a big fan of your work trying to pass climate bills. I want to begin the conversation here with what we're trying to achieve. You'll often hear this idea or this goal of net zero. Net zero emissions. When? How? Talk me through what that actually means. Yeah, net zero emissions of all greenhouse gases, so all climate warming pollutants. And that is basically the point where we stop digging a deeper hole. You know, the first rule of holes is stop digging, right? Then you can figure out how to climb out. Next slide. He, he was conversationally masterful. He used the technical term. He piggybacked off what he was hearing from Ezra. But then he went to common language. Pairing the two is a great way to do it because you make people comfortable. Climate warming pollutants, words that most people would find pretty common. Then he goes on to talk about this notion of digging out of the hole. And you know we have to, we have to stop digging before we can climb out. What a wonderful big picture statement. So easy to follow, a little bit funny, right? Warming us up to the idea of this is a problem, but you know, there's a way to climb out of it. So I'm not sure how he created that, but I couldn't stop myself from digging into it and dissecting it for you because it's conversational and it illustrates the points. Common, concrete, conversational. And what I'm really saying here is that if you want to be an engaging expert, when you walk in the room, you don't think of yourself as the expert. You think of yourself as a person who has expertise. Because when you show up as a person talking to other people, that's automatically more engaging. When you connect with people at a human level, you build a different kind of rapport, which makes people more receptive to what you have to say. So be human and credible. So we've unpacked these three key concepts, communications tools, to how to be strategic, structured, and selfless when you speak. Now for my ask. And starting now, practice. Practice. It takes practice. I didn't get good at this day one. It takes practice. You have to make time for it. And I know I'm talking to people who are feeling overwhelmed already, but just in little ways, practice. Practice. Find ways to think about, who am I talking to? What am I saying to them? Do I have a message? Just little ways start to build these muscles. And here at Princeton, there are many ways you can practice. Now I get to plug some of the fabulous things that are going on here. You could give a graduate research talk. Putting that together will enable you to put these skills into practice. Rad Lab talks. A Rad Lab talks, talk is short. It's very casual, not high stakes. A great put your toe in this water if you're new at it. 
You can get involved with Lab Tales. You can at attend their storytelling boot camp. I already told you why I think it's probably one of the most important things for you to make time for, for your professional life. Science Outreach, Spring into Science. It's happening on the 22nd of April. It's a chance to talk to students, inspire them, help them learn more about the world from fourth grade to 10th grade, if I remember right. Another great opportunity to have a very specific group of listeners for you to practice. Research day, coming up, May 11th, three minutes. If you can take your work and talk about it in three minutes, you will be using these skills. Huge opportunity, I highly recommend you do it. Even if you don't submit your video, try recording one. It's a fabulous exercise in all of what I've been talking about today. Last but not least, Grad Futures programs. One of the skills they want you to have is the ability to communicate effectively. It's a key competency. So take advantage of those programs because they're designed for you. And what's nice about them, you meet with students from other parts of the university. Talking to people who don't go to the same classes that you do is a chance to practice. And guess what? You have a cell phone, your cell phone. Your smartphone, perfect tool for practicing. So no matter where you plan to take your career, carry with you the concepts we've talked about today. Put them into practice and keep them close by like your smartphone because they will help you reach your goals and be the rocket fuel for your career. Thank you. And I got to display how you hold it together when your audio. Your I, that was going to be my first question of, you know, there's always something that's going to go wrong. How do you keep calm through that? Well, that's practice also. That's also a mindset. And it's knowing your material, right? I, I can't get up here and speak like that without really internalizing everything I wanted you to learn today. And so, yes, I worked on it a lot. He would say I kind of over-practiced, but that's my nature, um, just how I roll. But you know, knowing it and just telling yourself that happens, it's not a reflection of you, it's just what happened. And thankfully I knew my material well enough that I, I could stay with it and had, had a good sense and thank you for yes. helping to switch slides. I did my best. Okay, and just a reminder that if you ask Q&A questions during this segment, you will get a signed copy of Championing Science by Roger and Amy. So, Which is right here, yes. so you, you can see it to inspire you for a question. All right, thank you for that. Well, one question I get asked a lot is, what if you're not the only expert in the room? What if you're in a talk where there are a couple of other people who are experts who will be kind of looking to see how much of an expert you are? That's when you want to give what we like to think about as a deep dive, where you are going to spend three or four minutes maybe getting into more detail, but the way you do it so that you're selfless and respectful is you say, so now I'm gonna dive pretty deep here for a few minutes. So for those of you who are gonna find that this is a little more than you can ha handle, hang with me, I'll be back. You know, just set the stage, let people know that you're doing it because you do need to show your technical chops when you've got a mixed group of people listening to you. Hi, thanks for this really interesting talk. Um, I'm wondering if you could just uh, talk for just a second about how much of this you think also applies to writing for uh, audiences, more general audiences. Do you think that there are anything you, is there anything you would add if translating some of these strategies into writing? Well, I think that not having the spoken voice is a missing piece, right? So many of the things that are engaging around voice are missing. But having a conversational voice in your writing style is far more engaging. And I'm seeing more and more of it. People are catching on that that does make a difference. Um, but a lot of the key principles, you have to grab attention. You've got to start with the big picture. You want to think about what's most important to the people you're targeting as your readers. So try put the word reader in and substitute it for listener, 
And I think a lot of this does apply. Analogies are really important. Again, it depends who's reading and what, what your goal is with what you're writing. You spoke earlier about, um, you know, you weren't rattled, you'd practiced and, you know, over-practiced, but you didn't talk about nerves. Like I people would, get nervous yep. when you're having to give a talk. Can you, can you talk about that part I, and how to deal with it? Absolutely. I have a little baggie in my briefcase with lemon wedges in it because what happens to me when I get nervous, when the adrenaline pumps, my mouth just goes totally dry. So that's a singer's tip, trick. I happen to be a singer. Um, lemon wedge. But uh, several things about nerves. Expect them. And instead of trying to hide your adrenaline rush, welcome it. It lets you be bigger. It gives you a boost of energy. What happens is most of us go, oh, I can't let that show. And, and, and trying to contain it, it's like telling your dog not to chase the squirrel. Like you can't, you can't contain your adrenaline. So expect it, welcome it, and then make sure you've taken proper care of yourself. And what I mean by that is eat the right food. Don't drink too much coffee if that's going to get you even more amped. I'm a big believer in protein several hours before you speak. I, don't, I can't have lunch right before I talk, but I can eat three hours ago, and I did, and I ate protein. So understand your own body, your own body chemistry. And then my other big recommendation is about breath work. There's so much great breath work, but just in general principle, if you have a longer exhale than your inhale, it, sh it slows your body down. Um, I, I like to share Dr. Andrew Weil's 478 breathing technique. You can look him up and see him do it on video. If, I, if this was a workshop, I'd have you doing it with me because you can really feel how it changes things. And you know, it's a, it's a life skill. Like when you're in those scary moments waiting for a doctor to give results on something, you're going to want that, not just when you're in front of the room. Those are breathing techniques that'll serve you well. The Navy SEALs do something called, um, um, oh gosh, I'm forgetting the name, but it's 444 breathing, square breathing, um, where they do, but they do it for a long period of time. And the nice thing about breathing is that if you're sitting and waiting to be introduced, you can pretty much do that without people noticing, as long as you're not exhaling loudly. So those are just a few of my, my recommendations. This is more of a maybe practical question, because a lot, if you're doing advocacy, a lot of your talks will end in a call to action. And I find call to, calls to action very hard to make in a very concise, direct way without being jarring to sort of the flow of the previous conversation, for the previous um, talk. So can you maybe elaborate a bit on what you think makes a good call to action? Well, it goes back to what your goal is, because when you're clear about that, it helps inform what kind of call to action you have. And sometimes it's just simply a question to get people to engage in dialogue. So I, I'd like to better understand what you meant by it's jarring. You mean that it suddenly happens, that you haven't set it up that it's going to happen? Is that what you mean? Sometimes if you tell a story during a talk, you end up with a natural conclusion of what you've done and then transitioning to what you would like someone else to do for you in, as a result of that is the, the difficult part to sort of smooth that. Gotcha. So you said the key word. It's how do you transition? How do you make a link that ties things together? So when I design a talk and I'm getting ready to practice it, I print it out in PowerPoint. You can print out um, nine up so you get little thumbnails. And I literally write my transition statements. I think about them. I decide, how do I hook this together so that it doesn't do what you're concerned about, which is be abrupt. So it's a, think, it's a thinking process, but then get really clear about what you are going to say so it gets you there. Questions, we'll make it quick and short. All right, I'll be short. How do you handle some of the questions you can't answer when you're trying to be selfless? Like how much does it cost or how long is it gonna take when you totally can't tell them? You say, I don't know yet. Here's what I think might be the case, but I am just giving you my best guess, I don't know yet. Having the integrity to answer in a forthcoming way is so much more credible than trying to come up with a number on the spot.
Uh, thank you very much for a very engaging talk. I had to be engaging. <laughs> it was my job. <laughs> thank um, you. My question is uh, uh, really short. What is a good balance uh, between uh, improvisation and uh, memorization? That's personal. That's absolutely personal. And it depends on how much time you have. So if you have to meet a set time period, you have to practice enough with your improv to be sure that you don't go over. I could have embellished in a lot of places, and I had to really reel it back because I was trying to pack so much into this seminar. So I had to work through that. But it really is up to you. It's up to the time limit that you have. Do you think there are uh, situations in which the, the audience expects you to be more um, a lot of content? Uh, sometimes I feel that if I am being too personal and I'm thinking about a, a lecture that I recently gave in which I spoke about my kids and how, how they, um, well, they, they were connected to the idea of the talk I was giving. And I felt a little bit discomfortable afterwards because I thought uh, they were expecting more graphs with lots of equations and stuff on top of it than what I presented. So, Well, I don't know the forum you were in, but I think when you connect as a human being and you share something personal that's relevant, it's an effective way to get people engaged. If your goal was to inform and you feel like you were a little light on that, then you have to ask yourself, what other key points should I have made and how could I have done it in a way that would have worked in the, in the situation you were speaking in? But I, I'm, as you just heard, I'm a big believer that in order to create connection, we have to show up as human. Line, um, I'll just like wrap the session with that because we are already four minutes over. But um, this anonymous attendee asks, really like your tips, uh, example, storytelling, evoking emotions, et cetera, which is very different from the academic presentations we are used to. I want to try your tips. Meanwhile, I worry about my credibility as a graduate student when I present to other academics. Oh, this What advice would you give to a young researcher wanting to push this boundary? This is the perfect question to end on. I said in the beginning, your ability to do this effectively will help you stand out. I encourage all of you to stand out. Be who you are in front of the room. That's gonna make you the best possible presenter when you get comfortable enough with what you're saying that you can really be who you are when you're in the front of the room. And I need to say that the old formal ways of showing up at technical conferences can be pretty boring. So you're gonna get people a whole lot more excited and they will remember you if you have the courage to do it a new way. So I hope I've changed your thinking today. I wanna to especially thank Sonali and um, Sammy, the co-sponsoring this event, inviting me here, the whole team at Grad Futures. Thank you, Ava. I just, it's been a pleasure to be here with you all today. Thank you for, for coming.